Hi, it's me from Ghosty Digits and in this video we're gonna learn about interrupts and how to use them in PIC microcontroller. So, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and without further ado, let's jump into it. For the first few minutes, I will be discussing interrupts in general and why we need them. Then I go more specific and discuss interrupts in PIC ETNF and how to use it. And finally, we start writing code for our project. Back to our point, interrupts. Let's take it from your day-to-day -day life. You're watching this video on your smartphone or personal computer and suddenly your friend texts you with a message. Many of you guys are going to leave this great video behind and go reply to him. And that's fine, cause I'm gonna use that to illustrate my point. So your friend sending you a text is the interrupt because it suspended you from doing your main task which is watching this video. Back again to the microcontroller and it's not a big difference. You've made it this far and know that a microcontroller executes the same lines of code repeatedly over and over again. But sometimes there is an event that requires the microcontroller to suspend executing the main code and go handle this event. And it may be as urgent as a car hitting something and having the microcontroller to respond as fast as possible and blow up the airbag. And without interrupts, if the microcontroller was busy doing something else, then the response would not be instantaneous. And that's one benefit of interrupts, which is having the microcontroller handling important events with minimal delay. Okay. What would you do after finishing texting your friend? Typically, you'd go and continue the video you'd left before. And that's exactly what a microcontroller would do after processing the event. It goes and executes the main code. And to be honest, what I call the main code here could be thousands of instructions and it doesn't make sense to go and execute it from the beginning every time an interrupt occurs. And interrupts are more likely to be random and can happen while the microcontroller is executing any instruction. And here is what makes sense. Let's say that the microcontroller has been interrupted during executing the instruction at address 1000. Of course, it's again to finish this instruction, then say the address of the next instruction into something called program stack. Then the microcontroller jumps to the interrupt vector, which is a portion of memory where the interrupt handling code is written, and as a starting address is known to the microcontroller. For big 18 f the interrupt vector starts at address 0008H for high priority interrupts, or address 0018H for low priority interrupts, and the difference between them will be discussed later. Here is the microcontroller going through the interrupt service routine. And the interrupt service routine is a function you write your code inside of it, and the microcontroller will place it inside the interrupt vector or at address 0008H for this case. So back again, the microcontroller will go through the interrupt service routine, executing all the instructions there, and when it's done, it goes to the stack pops the address saved earlier and goes to that address in memory and continues executing the code from that instruction there. Okay, let's move on to the circuit for this video. I woke up this morning with only one thing in my head. What if I designed a circuit that does more than one task? And here is the circuit. I have two LEDs, one is red and one is yellow, and there is no special thing about the colors here. The red one should be blinking every two seconds, and the yellow one will fill up its current status for every button press. And of course, I don't do my videos based on my daydreams, so the point is, this project is not going to work. So let's see my big failure. So I run the simulation. And here we have the red LED is blinking, which is a good sign, so let's go and press the button. Good, it didn't work. So I think I deserve another chance. Oh, that's really confusing. So let's try again and have a conclusion. Nothing. 
So apparently this circuit had failed me and didn't work. You have failed this city. And one thing we should learn is why it didn't work or exactly why the LED responded only on the second try. And there is nothing special about the order. It's all about how long you press the button. First the second time I pressed the button for more than two seconds and this circuit requires a button to be kept pressed for two seconds so that the LED can respond and fill up as a status either to on or off. So why is that? To understand it you should take a look at the code. Here is my masterpiece. Let's go through it as fast as we can. RP0 is connected to the LLED and hence its made output. RP1 is connected to the push button and its input. Finally, RC0 is connected to the red LED, so its output. And this line here sets the initial status of RP0 to be 0. And then we go inside the infinite loop. This line blinks the red LED and then the delay MS function to keep the microcontroller busy doing shit for 2000 milliseconds then the if statement to check for the button if it's pressed go inside flip the status of RB0 and logically this code is fine but as you can see we have the delay MS function and the microcontroller gets the stock here for 2 seconds and as a result the microcontroller will check the status of the push button roughly every two seconds and it takes only one microsecond to execute this F statement. So, the chances you hit the push button exactly while the microcontroller is executing the F statement is impossible and that's why we have to keep the button pressed for two seconds so when the microcontroller finishes the delay function and goes to check the button it will be already pressed. Bottom line is Polling is not efficient. The event may happen and even ends before the microcontroller can check it. That's why using an interrupt is ideal solution for this case. Let's move on to interrupts in PKTNF. There are two types of interrupts, external and internal. External interrupts are generated by devices or components connected to the microcontroller such as buttons or sensors but internal interrupts are generated by peripherals inside the microcontroller itself such as timers or the AD converter module. Since we're using interrupts in this video to respond to button presses, so let's focus on external interrupts. In PKTN F2550 we have external interrupts on pins RB0, RB1 and RB2 and these interrupts are named INT0, INT1 and INT2 respectively so when does an interrupt occur? An external interrupt is generated when there is a transition either from high to low or low to high on the corresponding pin. And we can select the edge at which the interrupt is triggered by setting or clearing the corresponding end edge bit. For example, if we set end edge 1 bit in Intercon 2 register to 1, then we have RB1 generates an interrupt every time there is a transition from low to high on that pin, which is a rising edge. And if we set it to 0, we have the interrupt occurs on the high to low transition or the falling edge on that pin. There is another couple bits associated with this interrupt, an enable bit and a flag bit. As I said, big microcontrollers have lots of interrupt sources and it's not appropriate to have all of the interrupts enabled all the time even if you don't need all of them. So here we have an enable bit attached to every interrupt to enable or disable it. So enabling an interrupt will force the microcontroller to respond when the interrupt occurs but disabling an interrupt means the interrupt can be triggered but the microcontroller will not respond. For external interrupts such as INT1, this bit is called INT1IE and INT3 register. And this is not the only problem here. If you have more than one interrupt enabled and one of these interrupts is triggered, the microcontroller will jump to the same interrupt service routine for all interrupts. 
At this point, you're left with no way of knowing which interrupt has triggered and of course you cannot handle all the interrupts the same way. And that's where the flag bit comes up. Whenever an interrupt occurs, there is a corresponding flag bit that is set. This means inside the ISR, which is a short for interrupt service routine, you should check all the flags for the interrupts you have enabled to figure out which one is set and handle the interrupt appropriately. For RP1, this flag bit is called int1if and int count to register. And there is another bit that's not attached to any certain interrupt and it's called the GIE bit or the global interrupt enable bit. And it's used to control the behavior of the microcontroller when an interrupt has been triggered. How is this? When this bit is cleared, the microcontroller will not respond to any interrupt even if its corresponding enable bit is set. This bit is useful in two ways. First, it allows for a quick way of blocking all interrupts. Maybe at some point in your code you don't want interrupts to interfere so you set this bit to zero and make it one again when you're done. The other thing is the microcontroller automatically clears this bit before jumping to the ISR so you don't have an interrupt interfering the current interrupt you're handling. And the microcontroller sets it again when it's done with the ISR and it's all done in hardware. Okay guys, let's go back to our project and see if we can make it more functional. Open MP Lab and start a new project and as usual copy the configuration bits from any of the previous projects and here we go. Inside the main function, the first four lines are the same as the previous code, so let's skip. Then we should enable the external interrupt on RB1. As I said, this is done by setting into one IE bit and into count 3 register. Then we select the edge at which the interrupt is triggered. We want an interrupt when we press the button and that's when the voltage is going from high to low or the falling edge. So clear int edge 1 bit and int count to register. If we let it to be 1, then the interrupt is triggered whenever you release a button. You can try it yourself if you don't understand this bit enough. Then don't forget to set GIE bit and int count register. And here is a pro tip. If you think you have everything done right but it still has a microcontroller not responding to interrupts, maybe you forgot to enable interrupts globally. So go and set it to 1. And another thing to note here is there is no register named Intercon 1. There is Intercon, Intercon 2, and Intercon 3. Then we write the infinite loop. And we keep the LED connected to RC0, switching between on and off constantly. And we add a 2 second or 2000 millisecond delay. And we will not deal with the pawn inside of the main function, but inside the ISR. So this is how you write the ISR, void, interrupt, whatever name you choose, most guys will go and name it just ISR. If you have background with big 16 family, you may have noticed it's a little bit different. Anyway, before doing anything, you should check for what interrupt has occurred by testing the flag of the interrupts you have enabled. Since we've enabled only one interrupt, it's not necessary, but no harm of adding it, so here how we can do it. We check the RB1 interrupt to flag bit if it's set, meaning the interrupt that have just happened is RB1 interrupt, and we go and toggle the status of the LED connected to RB0. And never, never forget to clear the flag associated with the interrupt you have just handled, or the microcontroller would jump forever into the ISR even if there is no interrupts. And let's clear it, and we're done. So let's go build the project and test it on Protoss. Here we go again. Let's run the simulation and see if it's worth the trouble. But don't forget to upload the code first, then hit the triangle here. Definitely the LED is blinking, but let's see what happens when we press the button. Definitely I press the button for much less than 2 seconds and it worked. Let's try again, and here it is. Bottom line is, interrupts made this project possible. Okay guys, this is the end of the video, go ahead and hit the subscribe button.
And don't forget to activate the bell to know when I upload my next video. Peace!